All right, let's get started. Let's have a word of prayer first. Father, we do thank you that we can be here this evening. We ask, Lord, that you guide us as we uh, look into your word. Just thank you for the great privilege of being able to study your word and to discuss it with the body of Christ. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, go for it. We have some uh, questions before we begin. So I have your notes, right? I think it's... Um, so my first question is here, where you referenced Romans 3.27, mm-hmm. particularly number 3. You said they are taking in the rich flow that comes through the root. Yes. And my thing is, if God's, if, if God's plan all along was to include the... Um, Oh, I think I just got that. Oh. Right, it said they're taking in the rich food that comes through the roof. Mm-hmm. He's talking to the Gentiles, right? Yes. Yes. What verse is that again? Uh, it says, well, it's, you're referencing 327 to 30. Oh, okay. So but this is your notes from... The last one they just sent yeah. out? Oh, so the 11. Okay, okay. Got it. So I'm not sure. I think you're in probably... Where are we now? When we we're, we're in 12 now. We're going to be we're we're in 12. But days. I think this is 11, 13, and 14. I think this is a part of your discussion. Uh-huh. That. So first, my thing was like... Uh, the, the rich flow, which is Christ. Right? Yes, the root is Christ. I, is, I really believe that, yes. Right? It was going, so I wrote, the rich for the other dad the, um, was going to get to the Gentiles anyway, mm-hmm. or... Um, okay, here's because right before I say, before I say to take the rich flow, I said the point of this is they are sharing the promises made to Israel. Well, that's my, my I don't want to say my problem, but that's my thing. That's mm-hmm. my hurdle, Right? They're sharing in the promises made to yeah, and then the, the and Israel. Then, and then but, and Gentiles are incorporated. But how can they be incorporated if... Okay, now I'm coming back to it. How they can be incorporated if that was part of God's plan anyway? So God's plan always included the Gentiles. How are they incorporated into something that initially applied to them regardless? No, because the initial plan of God was to incorporate the Gentiles. He chose Abraham. And he created the Jewish nation through Abraham. Those are the natural branches. We are not natural. But we are standpoint. part of God's plans before there was a yes, before. But so how are we God's not plan was to incorporate. That's like saying, well, God's plan was to save us. But that means that we ended up getting lost and had sin and we were depraved and God redeemed us. So why aren't we redeemed automatically since his plan was automatically ultimately to, to redeem us? Because we knew that he... We were going to get lost. But he knew that humanity would depart from him. He knew that he would choose this man, Abraham. And that through him he would establish the nation of Israel. And that they would become like the mission field to reach the rest of the people. Paul is simply using a metaphor, which I think is an apt metaphor, that they would then be the natural, because they're the ones who were chosen and came from the line of Abraham. They would be the natural branches. And their mission was to go out and get the Gentiles and incorporate them. So either way, they're going to be incorporated because they were not part of the, the thing that started first. Like, you know, what started at Pentecost is a church. Now we go out and people who are not Christians become Christians. They become incorporated. They become part of the body of Christ. But they're, right now, they're not part of the body of Christ. Right now, we are the body, part of the body of Christ. When a new person comes in, they're incorporated. They're brought in. So for them to think that they are greater than us would be ludicrous, because we've been here. I've been a Christian since I was 15. I've been part of the body of Christ. For someone to be born again tomorrow and to think that somehow they're superior to me, it sounds funny to begin with. So imagine these Gentiles, because remember this... Why, well, would, he's why, giving, would, they, why would they not be on an equal level as you? They're they are of spiritually. Knowledge. Spiritually, okay. yes. Okay. And, and so far as being a believer, they are. But no, obviously they're not, not the same as me. Yeah. But for them to come in and think they're superior, the Gentiles are not simply thinking, oh, we're equal to the Jews. They're thinking they're superior. They're thinking the time of the Jews has passed. Uh, God has nothing to do with them anymore. They, you know, and if you look at the first century church, despite Paul's writings, despite what Paul says, this literally did happen. All the early church fathers are basically, your time is over, you guys are done, you're the Christ killers, you know, there's no, there's no room for you anymore. 
you know, and they, they want nothing to do with Jews. They basically saw Jews like an abomination. So it, even, despite even Paul's admonitions, it still ended up happening that the Jews were discarded or, or seen as less than. What do you mean by branches? Oh, because he uses the illustration of a, of a root and branches, like a tree. Okay. That's the, that's the illustration, the metaphor that Paul is using here in Romans to talk about uh, believing Jews and believing Gentiles. And he says, believing Jews are part of the natural tree. They were, they were from the actual root, you know, and they were the, they were the establishment. The Gentiles are brought in, they're, engraft, they're grafted into this. But again, he uses the metaphor to stress the fact that the Gentiles were, at one time, without God, without hope. They did not have the, they did not have the covenants, they did not have the promise. They did not, and of course, it, it, it was doubly worse for the fact that Jews were not being missionary type to them. But they did not have these things. The law, for example, was not given to Gentiles. It was given to Jews. Uh, the whole Old Testament is Jewish. It's about the Jewish people. And uh, for a Gentile to become part of that was like, you know, again, second-class citizen. And it's because of the promise of Christ and what Christ has done, and the new covenant, that now everybody has to come in through Christ. But they were the natural. Again, he's trying to build that balance of not letting either side boast. Not letting either side, because again... Right now, we don't have that problem. Maybe not in this church, obviously. Maybe not, maybe not even a church, a church that's mixed. Um, I'm sure that if I go to, let's say, you know, uh, Beth Israel, that I've heard such wonderful things of, uh, they don't have that problem. I'm sure that the Jews are not boasting over the Gentiles, the Gentiles are not boasting over the Jews. But in this church, in Rome, that was that problem. They, they were doing that. So again, it's part of the metaphor. He's going with the metaphor. But we were incorporated. But it, yes, it was always part of the plan of God. Then on page six, the best interpretation of what Paul is saying is this, a hardening has come upon part of Israel. Right? Part of Israel meaning those who refuse to listen. Is that how you mean how you mean that? Um, I love it. I'm interpret I'm, I'm having to interpret myself. That's so funny. Uh, <laughs> uh, I wrote how so um, question, not all Israel um, Oh, that's my, so my question is, when you say a hardening has come upon part, part of, of Israel, Israel, until the right? fullness of Gentiles comes in. So that just the process, um, This is the process by which God has chosen to save all Israel. Uh, Israel is supposed to be a missionary uh, group reaching out to Gentiles so Gentiles can become part of the family of God. They reject that plan of God and become a, an exclusive membership, members only club. God, this, yeah, God disapproves of that. But God uses that hardening of theirs and their sinfulness and works through that to bring about the salvation of the Gentiles through, of course, Messiah Jesus, who is the ideal Jew who fulfills the covenant. But he uses their sinfulness and their hardening. They harden themselves. He then seals them in that hardening to bring in Gentile believers. But it doesn't mean that the, the, the Jews can never be converted. It means that it was a partial hardening for time so that this mission to the Gentiles will occur through the Messiah Jesus and now they are still open to being saved. Okay. It's not like the door is closed on them. Remember, the hardening is, is always uh, a no, temporary hardening. When you said a part of Israel, I, I'm, oh, because I now, felt like you oh, said like... Part of Israel, part of the national Israel, because think about it, Paul's a Jew, Peter's a Jew, all of the first believers are Jews. So it's not all national Israel so that's how you meant. Okay. that rejected Messiah. Only part of Israel rejected Messiah. Okay, so but there's okay. that through their disobedience and hardening. That's why even Paul says, oh, you know, when he's trying to minister to the Jews, and he finally says, you know what, I'm going to the Gentiles. No more of you guys. Forget it. Um, but this is, this is part of the plan of God, that the Jews would um, reject their Messiah, reject the, what, the, what God had for them, and God would then use this as a means to reach the Gentiles but then again, the door would still be open for Jews if they repented and came to God on God's terms. Okay. All right. My last point, my last question was on page 7, number 9. He said, um, uh, as the Messiah does so, he will banish ungodliness from Jacob. Mm -hmm. And I just have a question mark. Like what? <laughs> okay. I'm just trying to explain the, the passage from Isaiah 59. That's, this has nothing to do with the Romans passage has to do with the Isaiah 59 passage. I explained 
what is going on there. And that the plan of God ultimately was to, uh, ungodly in the sense of their rejection and not properly worshiping and honoring God, uh, God is going to banish that from the people of God. This, this thing that they have, this disobedience that they have. So the people of God is Jacob? Yes, yeah, just a name for Israel, another name for, for the people of God, yes. Oh. Sorry. Oh, I did not know that. You know, okay. it's just my notes. I don't, you know, when I'm, when I'm explaining it, I might not even use Jacob. I might oh. say Israel. But in my mind, sometimes I'll use Jacob, knowing that Jacob is synonymous with Israel, because Jacob is the guy who was named Israel. Oh. The first time Israel appears is Jacob. He has the, the struggle with the, with the angel in uh, Genesis 32. And... He is renamed Israel, which literally means one who struggles with God and prevails. And so he is given the name Israel, but then it becomes also a name for the nation. Okay. That concludes my question for you. Thank you very much. Oh, cool. No problem. Mm -hmm. I'll go back to my seat. Now. All right. Any, any other, anything, any questions arising from that? One thing is, I mean, that um, there's another big secret. You know, God doesn't give up easily. I mean, actually, He doesn't give up. <laughs> there you go. Whatever He has, <laughs> it's an expression, but it's better than that. Well, in part, he, in part, He has to. Because God doesn't give what? He doesn't give up. Oh. But in part, He has to think about it because every person that ends up in hell is God having lost. Because well, that's not His desire, that's oh, not His will. Yeah. So, but it's not a summary decision. Oh, yeah, exactly. Exactly, because he gives us free will. But, uh, yeah, he eventually he has to give up because eventually people have their own choice and they he lets them choose to not want to be with them. Because I am amazed how he uses the direct way, the not so direct way. Mm -hmm. He's going around and oh, he yeah. has things that are mixed up. He uses them. What is the expression? Either you are a tool or you are a whatever it was. Or a son. God used you, Angela. I wouldn't be sitting here today huh? if it wasn't for God using you. Oh, la, la. At the Board of Elections. You were at the Board of Elections. Yeah. And I remembered you and I remembered the church and that's the reason why I came back. Wow. Yeah. Okay. C.S. Lewis said that you're either, you're either God's son or you're God's tool. Means yeah, God, yeah. yeah, God's going to work with you one way or the other, yeah, either voluntarily or involuntarily. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just like I did with Pharaoh. Pharaoh was yeah, involuntarily, yeah, yeah. but the purpose of God will be accomplished no matter what. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure when we get to heaven, we'll see all the all the finer details of. You know, so many times, many times, so people, many times people might look at history and go, oh, "Where is God? Where is God?" Probably when we get to heaven, we're like, "Whoa, He was everywhere. <laughs> he was involved in every aspect." But all right, let's go to Romans 12. <clears throat> and verses 1 and 2. We're going to do the first two verses, then we'll move on from there. Siam, wait, everybody there? Romans 12, 1 and 2? Okay, Siam, would you read that for us? <clears throat> A living sacrifice. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is true worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Amen. Okay. True worship, that's the way they render in the old, oh man, it's just NIV, it's just they can't, it won't come to, to putting it, okay, we'll get to that. Um, uh, Paul now begins in chapter 12, he makes a, a turn, and... You know, up to chapter 11, he's been dealing with all these deep theological issues and things like that. And now in chapter 12, he makes, he turns a page and he gets into much more uh, ethical issues. Now, Paul, of course, doesn't have like a thin line between theology and ethics. His theology is always ethical and his ethics are always the theological. He's always going to mix them. But you can tell that now beginning chapter 12, he gets into many more, many more practical things. Uh, issues about how to behave, how to live, how to get along with each other. Um, the one question that... Uh, any questions? I always... Okay. The one question we keep in mind is that how much of this is Paul just stating what he believes and how much of it is Paul dealing with problems that are actual in Rome? Because when Paul wrote, for example, to the Corinthians, everything he's writing is because there's a problem in Corinth. 
But the church in Rome is not his church. He didn't establish it. He's not been there. He may have heard about things that are going on. And I, I really do believe, as, as many scholars do, that chapter 14 and 15 deal with personal issues of the church in Rome. But chapter 12 and 13 is more Paul giving general instructions about what he believes about how to live and how to be a Christian and how to move around in the world. Uh, but 14 and 15 are more like, hey, these are issues that are going on there between the weak and strong and stuff like that, the Jews and Gentiles and things like that. But given that Paul um, lived, in a, in a, uh, lived in an environment where there were Romans, he would be familiar with their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. it's, no, it's no secret that the Romans um, had little regard for anyone else's body, so to speak. Because, when, I mean, based on history, they've engaged, like men would engage in sexual activities with men and consider themselves um, heterosexual because they weren't the one, you know. Being penetrated. Just saying. Yeah. <laughs> Just saying. <it. laughs> right? So they had little regard for yeah. that kind of stuff. As, you know. They were all about their God still. So now he, he be, he's not talking about the Roman people. He's talking about the Roman Christians. He's giving instructions. Yeah, but the Roman Christians are are um are uh they're non they're non Jewish. Okay. So they're pagan. They're coming from a pagan background. But here, okay, let me give let me give you an illustration. Um, yeah. As a pastor, I'm going to write a letter uh, to a church in North Bergen. I know some things about them, but not really a whole lot's going on. So I might write my letter and say, you know, my general beliefs about how I believe Christians should handle things. But then I might deal specifically with a problem that I've heard about, you know, you know, uh, someone came and told me about an actual problem there, or I've heard, you know, I, I've been told about it. So I write specifically about that issue. That's the difference. It's like saying, you know, you write into church, you know, basically what you believe, your own ethical beliefs about things. But then you're applying that to a very specific issue that's going on in, uh, in the church. That's it. It has nothing to do with the Roman people, because obviously Roman, Roman people are, are, you're right, they're pagan. And Roman Christians are mixed. They're Gentiles and Jews. And, and the Gentiles, of course, are multi. They're not, most of them probably might not even be Roman, because most, uh, most believers were from slave backgrounds. So most of them probably were not Roman to begin with. Um, so he says, first he's going to outline what he believes about just basic, general, ethical, behavior, spiritual, knowledge things. And then he's going to tackle uh, actual problems that are going on. And you'll see when we get there, you'll see the difference. When, when I have read previously about Romans, Paul mm -hmm. forces his beliefs on others. He wants you to believe as he believes. You were just saying that as a minister, you would write a letter that then you would share your own certain stories about what's going on. In the Bible, when it comes to Paul, like it's like history repeating itself. Paul led Romans, <coughs> some Romans into corruption. Paul had certain situations that he would force his beliefs on people, men with men. Certain people are into that, certain people aren't. But you know what I'm saying? It well, Paul is different. Paul, uh, first of all, Paul does not impose his views in the sense that he's not, um, he's not a dictator and he doesn't kill anybody who doesn't follow his beliefs. On the contrary, he was, he's, he was pers heavily persecuted mm -hmm. and he was ostracized in many cases. Uh, but secondly, Paul is an apostle. Mm. He's not you and me. Mm. Uh, right. he, he's been, and he's been not only sanctioned by Christ, but the other apostles acknowledge that he has had a one one on one with Jesus that other people don't. So when he speaks, he speaks with the authority of Christ. That's very different from you know a pastor or a teacher or a prophet or anybody else. He's an apostle. Mm. Uh, that's like you know straight from the horse's mouth. So and <laughs> and when he's teaching, he's teaching that he's taking the the teachings of Christ mm. and then applying them into a Gentile context. Mm. Um, but again, when he talks about sexual morality, sexual morality, he doesn't care whether you're into that thing or not into that thing. It's a question of whether what is right and what is wrong, what is ethical, what is not ethical. 
He has no concerns about what people feel or think. What does God say? How does God say it would behave? And so he takes the ethics of Jesus and then applies it now to a new context. Uh, Jesus was just the same way. Jesus, of course, is not coming around saying, well, you know, you guys, if you feel up to it and you really like this, you know, you might want to implement it. He says, no, I'm telling you, this is the way it is. And so Paul does the same thing. Paul just says, no, this is the way it is. Hmm. There's, but again, Paul's an apostle. He's not, I you know, you. a pastor can be off, uh, you know, many people can be off. A, an, and yet he was, he was attacked. And he had to defend himself. Um, but again, he was an apostle. All the other leaders acknowledged that he was not like, you know, John Doe in the pew. He's, this, this guy is one of, you know, if, if there would be a 13th apostle, this guy would be it. Because he had that kind of authority. And obviously a, a very powerful personality within the early church. 13 of the letters that we have in the New Testament are all his. Uh, but his authorities are acknowledged by the church in Jerusalem, which is the mother church. Going back to what came before, the slaves at that moment, at that time, mm -hmm. uh, usually the slaves came, one of the reasons by being bought, but others that were taken from the war, and if they were taking people from a, one area, mm -hmm. they became slaves. So that's why I would say that, I would say that Many people have many origins. Yes, right. Yeah, there were many types of slaves from many different countries. If you were involved in warfare with Rome and you lost, you were automatically a slave. You're being sold as property. So you were taking possession. Exactly. You were automatically taken and sold as possession. And it didn't matter if you had a PhD in Greek or you were a farmer. <laughs> you were now, and so of course, the more educated ones took on jobs, high jobs. You know, like Julius Caesar's slave. The guy was obviously very knowledgeable. In it. He was in many different languages, knew how to write, knew how to do things. So they were not, they were not, again, just people were just taken out. Of, these people were, may have been very educated people and so on. But the early church was primarily composed of the lower classes and slaves of that, not of the elite. But they did have the elite as well. Not only Roman elite, but obviously just elite overall, like Paul himself was not a prominent uh, person financially, but he was a Roman citizen. And obviously he had a, he had a, a pretty good education. So it was a popularity of, uh, popularity of uh, cultures and yeah. origins. And yeah, medicine. which makes them a very unique group because here they are coming from, I mean, this is unheard of. You're not gonna have a context in the early Roman Empire where uh, someone who, who holds a, a treasure position is in, a, in a town with a slave in the same house worshiping the same God. That's just unheard of. You know, uh, that kind of fellowship, which is what, what the body of Christ is doing, is unheard of. That never happened. Uh, if you if the slave was in the house of the treasurer, it's because he was working there or something like that, but he was not there to have fellowship with him and to break bread as brothers in Christ. That was unheard of. So Paul, you know, what's happening here is very radical. And of course, in some ways, undermines the very system that's there, which is what the church always does. It undermines the system that is there, because it says we will not be by we will not be divided by cultural lines, uh, sexual lines, nothing lines. We're all one. Whether you're Jew, Gentile, male, female, slave, free, we're one in Christ, and we're equal. We're all brothers and sisters. That's this powerful language. Any other questions? Um. In verse one, I can see like feel like that can be read and understood to think that offering yourself as a sacrifice mean meaning that you kind of unwillingly do things for uh for God at that you it gets to that point you know mm -hmm. uh and that's that's not what's being you know proposed here right no not at all okay. no he's de he's definitively saying that's um. First of all, he's urging them, which means he's uh, exhorting them, not commanding them. That's, this is not his church. He did not start this church. He's not the apostle of this church. He's writing to them and introducing himself. And so he's giving his doctrinal beliefs, and now he's, now he's exhorting them. In light of all that he has said, this should be the response. Paul basically says, look at the theology I gave you. Look at all I told you about Christ, who he is, what he's done. In light of that, this should be your response to give your body as a living sacrifice to the Lord. 
Um, Paul, of course, um, talks about mercy here in the light of the mercies of God. Now, the word he uses is very interesting because it's not common for him. Um, the word he uses is different from the, the regular uh, word for mercy. But the word here means to display of concern over another's misfortune, pity, mercy, compassion. Basically, Paul says, in light of the fact that you were in a pathetic, miserable state <laughs> and God redeemed you, this should be your response. This, there should be no other response but to give your body as a living sacrifice to God. That's how I, that's actually my translation there, so just so you know, it's not, you know, if, if anybody ever tells you that, so you know that I'm not coining this. I, in my own analysis, realize this is what Paul is telling them, because he uses a different word for mercy, which basically is to see someone in a pitiful state and rescue them and help them. And he says, God saw you in the most pitiful state. He's redeemed you. Look at all, of, all that I told you about the love of Christ and how he redeemed us. This is your, this is, should be your response. Um, Sure. Uh, my wording is, I wrote, in light of God's great mercy that came to you when you were in a miserable condition, this is how you should respond to such mercy. That's my, my paraphrasing of what Paul's saying with that, with that word there. Uh, Anti Wright uh, tells us the verse indicates that the foundation of all Christian obedience is that those in Christ, indwelt by the Spirit, are to offer to God the true sacrificial worship to which the cult of the Jerusalem temple had all along pointed. Um, Paul basically does here for the temple what he did in chapter 2 for circumcision. In chapter 2 he tells us real circumcision is of the heart. Real sacrifice in the temple is you giving your life to Christ. That's real sacrifice. Not going in the temple and giving some animal and having it uh, killed for your sins. The real sacrifice, the thing that it was looking forward to, was that you were going to put yourself on that altar and give yourself to God. So you don't go to that altar, again, metaphorically, because he doesn't believe the temple has that power anymore. You don't go to that, to that altar and you give anything other than yourself to God. That's the only appropriate sacrifice. Um, body here, of course, entails more than the physical aspect of, of our existence. It talks about the entirety of who we are. Here I want to quote two parts from uh, uh, James D.G. Dunn because it's so good. It says, The point to be emphasized, however, is that soma, body, uh, denotes not just the person, but the person in his corporality, in his concrete relations within the world. It is because he is body that man can experience the world and relate to others. He goes on to say, It is as part of the world and within the world that Christian worship is to be offered by the Christian. In other words, the reason the body is being used is because it is you in the fullness of your existence, in the concrete of your existence. Not like, oh, I give my heart to Jesus. Mm. <laughs> or my spirit belongs to him, but my body I can do whatever I please with. No, the body represents all of you. And, and you in relation to everything in the world. How you relate to other people, how you relate to God, everything. That's the entirety of who you are. You have to give all that to God. Mm -hmm. Now remember, like I mentioned on Sunday, and I want to repeat it because it's so important. Christians are incredibly odd birds in the first century on many levels. And here, and I mentioned this Sunday, but I want to repeat it here. Um, they worship in no temple, yet they are the temple. They have no physical priest, yet Christ is their high priest. <laughs> they offered no sacrifices, and yet their bodies are sacrificed to the Lord. Contradictory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's all so radically different from the ancient the ancient world will look at them like you're so you mean you, you don't go to the temple we don't no temple Zeus no, no nothing really you know you have no priest you know no oracles you know you know it's like and, and you're the sacrifice do you mean not not like a pigeon what, 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 what? no really they would it, it's not all odd. it's weird this now for today we accept it it's funny how the weird religion has become the norm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and people now take it for granted. This is what the, a religion should be all about, about these things. But in the ancient world, it wasn't. It was an actual, about an actual physical structure, temple, actual pri priest who had only, that was their function, and you brought a sacrifice to be given to the gods or the god, and that was it. And yet it's all radically different here in Christianity. Of course, we are a living sacrifice. And the reason it says is because, obviously, uh, you don't go to the altar and slash your throat or kill yourself um, uh, or, or give a dead animal. 
you are present living everyday sacrifice to the Lord. It's so much easier to give an animal <laughs> and to say, here, Lord, here's my, or even say, Lord, here, here's my $10. Here, Lord, here's my house. Here's my car. But to say my body, my life, my all, my breath, that's tough. And that's exactly what, what we're called to do. That's, that's the living sacrifice. Um, so it's everything to do, everything that we have being presented to God. Holy, which of course means uh, exclusively separated for the service of God. When something is holy, it means that it, it, its proper function is only <coughs> unto God. So that everything we do, really, no matter what we are we do in life, we belong to God. And so in every way we have to honor Him. We can't say, well, it's only when I'm in the church building, or only when I'm here or there, or under these circumstances. No, everywhere, you are the temple. Wherever you go, the presence of God goes, period. So you have to honor God in everything you do, everything you say, everything you think. Again, heavy duty. Any question? I just find funny, funny to call it something. When I look back, the... the the offering of animals, the killing of that. I have always found that so that people go through those things. Of, you know, doing that for me, because I guess because I'm in the, at this time in life, mm -hmm. I find it silly mm -hmm. that they would go through killing animals and things like that. Uh, when for me, God has always been more than that and just offering a. a, a but, but are we not better. we're different not better. but we're not that different I mean look we, you know, one of the things we were talking about I think it was Arlene who brought up I think it was Sunday whatever the whole thing about Lent you know? or you won't sacrifice a, a pigeon but you're going to give up smoking for 40 days again it's, like, it's, it's, a hu it's part of the human psyche to want to sacrifice something give something bring something to God Think about it. when we're trying to negotiate with God, what do we do? Lord, if you do this, mm -hmm. I'll do that. I'll give you this. I'll go there. I'll go to church. I'll do this. We're negotiating. Uh, so we're not, we're not that different. No, I know, but I find it so... And there's so still, funny. of course, of course, the sacrificing animals still exist today. No, I Animals know. are still being sacrificed. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In India, they still sacrifice animals. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would think that a nation... Oh, sorry. I shouldn't say. Uh, I would think a nation that's starving would not be sacrificing anything, <laughs> you know. And uh, but that's just my philosophy. What can I say? I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. But they're not sacrificing to God. To well, to, to their God. Well, exactly. Their God. Yeah. To their God. No, no. I'm saying they still sacrifice. Mm -hmm. You know, there's still places where sac physical sacrifices are made that way. Okay. Now we come to any other questions. Um, now, the, the new NIV, obviously, what I'm using, I can tell you, that's why I like to hear what you guys do. My, my new NIV says, this is your true and proper worship. Now, obviously, now, the, new, the old NIV there said, uh, true worship. Uh, the old NIV, 1984, said, your, this is your spiritual worship. And this is what the ESV and the NRSV still put. So, I don't know why. I need to write to these people. I don't know why. Is it something, do they have something against the mind, the spiritual things of the mind? Is, is the mind considered like evil? Or something? Yeah, I don't get it because the word there is not, it should not be translated all spiritual or, or even true. The, the Greek word for true is aletheias. It's not there. What, what, I don't know why they do it. I'll show you. What are you at the end of, uh, you're, you're talking yeah, about yeah. They're, they're changing, they're paraphrasing, they're changing no, they it, keep, they're they, not keeping it. How they render the Greek. Mm. The New Testament is written in Greek. How they read the Greek. Now, if, if Paul meant, this is your spiritual worship. Uh, so were they expecting words? He would have used something like, that has the word spiritual or spirit in it, which of course is where we get Pneumatikos. Oh my goodness. This is what he would have said. You know, pneuma, of course, bread, you know, the Holy Spirit, pneuma. This, he would have used pneumatikos. Instead, the word that he uses is Loki Yeah, the NASB says that. What does it say? Which is your spiritual service of worship. No, no, still, no I'm saying they're saying the same thing. Still spiritual. Like, yeah, yeah. The word is reasonable. Mine says this is truly the way to worship him. See, it's, it's focusing more on the true. 
Okay, true and proper. I understand what I think. I see what the enemy is going there with true and proper being reasonable. But the word itself means reasonable. Again, it's something to do with the mind, which is what you're going to talk about—the transformation of the mind. You know, uh, this is your reasonable worship. Um, the word means something that is carefully thought through, something that is worthy of thinking beings, something that pertains to humans and not animals. Because animals are not reasonable. They don't think. And there is a great quote that I found by Epictus. I don't know how to pronounce this guy's name properly. He's a Stoic, a Stoic uh, philosopher. Again, he, I, it's one of the most beautiful quotes ever, I think. This, this, again, this shows my love for the pagans, but that's another story. Because I hate when pagans are treated like, oh, they were just so horrible, and none of them were good, and I don't know what people are reading. This guy was a, a Stoic philosopher. He's actually uh, incredible because he actually was a slave, and he earned his freedom, and went on to become a philosopher. Wow. And not only a philosopher, but an incredibly influential philosopher within the Stoic uh, school of thought. Um, and this is his quote, and I'll, I'll tell you what the part, you'll see, well, you'll see when I get to a Loki, Loki cost, but let me just read this, it says, if I were a nightingale, I should be singing as a nightingale, if a swan, as a swan, but as it is, I am a rational being, therefore I must be singing hymns of praise to God. Mm -hmm. Wow, awesome, and of course the Greek where he says rational being, he says, Loki kas, a me, I am, I am reasonable. I am, a, I am a creature that has reason. If I was this kind of animal, I would be doing this. I was that kind of, but since I am a rational being, I must offer praise to God because that's what a rational being is. I think this is the appropriately should be rendered uh, reasonable. You know, it may, I don't know why they don't. I, you know, I guess there's, there's just a, there's certain propensities that exist in cultures, and I think sometimes in our culture, especially within the evangelicals, uh, there's like almost like, an, like a, you're intellectuals, but you're almost anti-intellectual at the same time, which makes no sense. I don't know why they do that because I mean, look, if if obviously if you're if you have if you have the NIV and you're translating for me, obviously you guys must be pretty bright because you know Greek, you know Greek better than better than, than the rest of us, and you're able to translate. So why should, would you take something that talks about the mind? And something is rational, and try to portray it like like spiritual. Uh, not say that the mind is, is is not spiritual, but say if Paul wanted to say something differently, he would have used a different Greek word, but he doesn't. Uh, he doesn't say true and proper either. And I'm trying to think of uh, Alethea's how to spell it, but it's not. But it's again, it's not. It's not uh, pneumaticas, and it's not uh, logikas. That's the that's the Greek word. Any questions? So it just there's I don't I, I don't understand it's at all, but uh there's that constant like uh emphasis being made in Christianity to keep uh to separate reason and uh spirituality as if they don't you know, like go hand in hand. Yeah, yeah. And it's I don't under, I don't understand how you can take one without the other. Because if they completely are like dependent on each other. Exactly. But again, that it's just again, it's it might be a it might be a cultural thing. It might be a cultural thing that again, because of our spiritual heritage, there there's uh, you know again being from the uh, you know the purists and stuff that a heavy focus on inner spirituality, spirituality, but but not intellectual. Despite the fact that these guys were intellectual. Even the people who are like the Puritans who are spiritual, they're writing deep books. <laughs> they know their stuff, but still, like most like an anti-intellectual. And I see people, for example, reference things, misreferencing things. Whether it's the passage in Korean uh, Corinthians about uh, we know we don't practice the wisdom of the world, which again is making it sound like that somehow that the intellectual stuff of the world is bad, or, or Colossians two a, which is notorious. That's like don't. Uh, they'll be entangled with the philosophies of this world and, and or philosophy of this world, and they translate to mean all philosophy, all thinking, which is ludicrous. So that's like that's like when they say that that Paul's against these things, um, and Paul is not. Well, even he doesn't do it. He says he, even uh, anti says true and appropriate worship. I guess that's that must 
be something in, in the meaning of Loki cost, but I give you the meaning is something carefully thought through. Logical. Uh, that is worth is logical. Yeah, I know, so I don't know again. They they don't know um, keep uh, they don't uh, I say they strain themselves or keep themselves into the line of translating as it it should be, regardless whether they're translated for the Bible or whatever, what the, what the word says is what the word well, says. Well, in, in, in not something there's, else. But there's, okay, there's problems I know because that's very precious, there's, there are different right? types of translations. You know, you know you're, you, you've done a lot of work with this, so you know it's a different types of translation. One, one are equivalent translations, mm -hmm. where they're more wooden, like the NASB tries to be more wooden. And it's almost like word for word of what it actually was, although here, they are, obviously, in the NASB, mm -hmm. there's not follow word for word. Despite their desire to do so, they did not change it. They did not run this word as they should. But normally they do that. The NASB tries to be very wooden that way. Uh, the NIV is a dynamic translation, which means they're trying to find the equivalent within this culture of what it would have meant in that culture. So they believe that obviously Loki uh in Paul's world would have meant true and appropriate worship um, and not simply reasonable. But again, true, I have no problem with true and appropriate worship. I understand. I see the logic of what they're saying and how Lokikos can, can have that idea. But originally, the NIV rendered it spiritual. The 1984 uh, NIV says spiritual worship. Um, and it's not that the word there is nowhere near uh, the idea of spiritual for Paul. But just, just those things. Just like, I said, just like I said on Sunday when I was preaching, that, that whole flesh thing has me so irritated. Because I, you know, I people just tell me, oh, but look, it says, it says, it says simple nature. And I'm like, yes, I see the translation. I see the translation. I see sarcos. You show me, you know, I know what it says in Greek, you know. And now, now the NIV now is coming back. And every single passage where they had translated sinful nature, they're now rendering flesh. Because it's sinful nature is something that misdirects us away from the thought of Paul. Which is what we should be trying to translate. But any other questions? All right, let's go to verse two, which again shows why the logical part makes sense. Why it's something reasonable. What do you say in verse two? Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. <laughs> then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Um, Verse 2 focuses on that renewal of the mind, which leads to renewal in one's lifestyle. We live in the new age of Christ. Oh, what did verse 2 say in, in that NIV? Yeah, it says, uh, <coughs> which is good, acceptable, and perfect. No, no, read, oh, do, do not conform to... Do, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay, again, I disagree with them. Okay, um, we live in the new age of Christ. We're no longer to conform to the old pattern, the pattern of this age. The Greek word there, world... I mean, the word, the word English, their world, in Greek is not world. In the, in the Greek is age. There are two different words in, in uh, he does not have cosmos there. I didn't write down the Greek word, uh, but luckily I have my Greek, so. Uh, du, 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 du. You know, again, the word world, I hate to be, I feel like I'm not spending my time correcting a translation rather than, the word world, of course, is cosmos. Paul translates, uh, how do you do the old? Ion. Is that correct? It's an old. Yeah, ion. Sorry, let me write that again for you. Sorry about that. Uh, this is a word that is, is cosmos. Age is. Now, it that sounds is, like... That is quite a... Yeah. Again, it sounds like no big deal, but it is a big deal. Quite a deal. Uh, Paul's following the Jewish idea that there are two ages. The present age and the age to come. But for Paul and his eschatology and his view of the end times, the old age is already passing away. The new age is defined by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. When Christ rises from the grave, the new age has now entered into being. So it's not simply the present age will lead to a future age and they're divided. They're now overlapping ages, which you've heard me talk about many times. 
So Paul sees this is the old age. And then, of course, the resurrection here. Let's put it here. Right? And then this is the new age. Now, the old age continues, but it's passing away. The new age has begun in Christ and will find its fulfillment when Christ returns and establishes all things and makes all things new. But this is the overlapping of the ages. That's why we are preachers in conflict. That's why we're struggling with flesh and spirit, because we're torn between two different ages. With the old age of sin and death are still here. It hasn't yet finished. But it has already been conquered here through Christ and will eventually be destroyed. And this pattern is following everything that Christ that, that Paul talks about. That's why he talks about how our, our outer man is wearing away, but our inner man is growing. Because this transition that we're in. And that as, I, as my body begins to decay and die, my spirit is getting stronger. Because I'm entering that new age of Christ. When Christ returns, he will make all things new. And the old age will finally pass away. Uh, sin and death will finally be conquered. There will be no more sin. There will be no more death. Uh, and everything will be renewed. But for the Jews, it was present age. Messiah comes. That's the future age. And Paul says, no, when the Messiah came, there's an overlapping of the ages. The old still continues. Obviously, we still see sin. We still see death. But we also see the hope of the resurrection, the new life, uh, the healings, the miracles, the changes. And these two things begin to go like this until eventually, of course, the old age will, will cease. So again, I think that when you put the word age, for me, it's more powerful than world, because world gives you the idea of cosmos, gives you the idea of the earth or the universe, but not of an age, of an epoch. In fact, you see the, you know, uh, two different time zones, if you want to say so. world doesn't give you that imagery at all. So again, I don't know why they put that word, but I'm not translating it. So. Any question? Yeah. And now, of course, you had a question? Okay, now the mind becomes very, very important also because think about it. When Paul began in Romans chapter 1, he talked about how people had not given God the worship he deserves, and so their minds became depraved. So it, it was connected to how you serve God. If you don't give God the proper honor, you will have an unfit mind. But if you give yourself as a living sacrifice to God, if you properly worship Him, you will have a renewed mind. How do we get that renewed mind? It doesn't just happen to sit around and go, oh, because you're properly worshiping God. You're properly giving Him what is properly His. Uh, they didn't. Uh, in Romans 1.28 it says, Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them more to a depraved mind, so they do not, so that they do what they ought not, what ought not to be done. Um, so the difference is between that unfit mind and the renewed mind. And the renewed mind comes from properly uh, worshiping God, which is giving yourself completely to Him. Um, are the ages running parallel to each other? Or is there like, um, like kind of like a line chart where it comes and then it goes for a while, then the new age goes up and the old age goes down? Well, no, no, uh, they're, they're parallel from this point on. On this time, before Christ came, this is what, again, would be called then, if I put it in, uh, in Romans uh, chapter 5, I would say this is the age of Adam. The old age is also the age. Paul has many names for one thing. I love that. Uh, it's just, he's, he's great that way. He's awesome. But. So this line goes like this. When Christ rises, the new age begins. And not in some new age spirituality. <laughs> Several people don't realize these things were our language before it became somebody else's language. This is the new age. And this one will stop when Christ returns. This will then only continue. Everything, oh, okay. everything will be renewed. This age is coming to an end. When Christ returns, okay. he'll create a new heaven and new earth. All things will be renewed. There will be no more tears, no more sin, no more death, no more nothing. Now the new age from that point on continues. The old age is passing away. It will, it will fade. Which, of course, the same kind of sim symbolism that Paul uses for the, the idea of Israel's law and Christ. The law came, 
but the law was meant to pass away. It was meant to, you know, to just like the glory of Moses disappeared from his face, it was, was going to fade away. But the glory of Christ will never fade away. It intensifies and gets greater until we see him face to face. Again, Paul uses this kind of imagery a lot to describe the, the, the two different ages, the two different ways uh, that the world is. And of course, Adam and Christ become the representatives of those two ages. Uh, Adam becomes a representative of death and sin because he's the guy who brought it into the world. <laughs> and Christ becomes the, uh, the representative of life because he brought it into the world. He brought eternal life to all of us. He, he, he brought the new birth to us. Um, but again, for the Jewish way of thinking, what Paul, what Paul realizes is that Christ did what should have happened at the end, in the middle of the story. Uh, the Jews believed, remember when... when um, when Lazarus dies, and read through chapter 11 of, of John, you'll see that Jesus says to, Mary, to Martha, don't you believe in the, in the resurrection? He says, of course I believe that one day we will rise. You know, because her, her belief is the Jewish belief, that when, when the end of all things comes, the Messiah comes, then resurrection comes. And Paul says, yes, but Jesus becomes the first fruits, the beginning of that resurrection. He becomes the signpost that our resurrection will occur. So in the middle of the story, a resurrection occurs for one Jew, one person. I don't know. No, no, just no, no, motorcycle, just going by fast. Oh, water? No, motorcycle going by fast. Oh, shit. <laughs> Good that he knows the song. Like, I don't know what that was. Um, okay, so that's basically, I'm, I'm, I'm repeating in many ways to, to us too, because it is a cool thing. Oh, yeah. No, something I thought about, but it, uh, so would it be accurate to, uh, for me to go on with this idea? Um, cause I just always, I heard this lyric in, uh, that song, the old song, uh, Come Now Is The Time To Worship, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, the singer, she says, like, one day every tongue will confess to her God, one day every knee will bow. Mm -hmm. So I see this, like, in, in the end, because Christ is going to return, then at that moment, and just, I was thinking, of course, and what the Revelation says as well, mm -hmm. you know, it's going to be that age where, you know, he's there. Um, and it's just like, there, there is not going to be a choice for in that matter, really. Everyone's going to just have to sit, it's like, you know, okay, we, we already knew who Jesus was, and here he is right in front of our face. So this is really what it is. But that's not, um, but like I was saying, I was like, wow, I feel pretty bad for those people who are going to see him, and then they're going to be like, oh, now I believe. And it's just like, that's, I think, when he says, uh, you know, when he goes and says to those people, I never knew you, I really think that, that's, mm -hmm. that puts a big emphasis in, in that understanding of, mm -hmm. of what really believing in him is and really worshiping him. Is like that, that relationship uh, aspect of mm -hmm. Christianity. Well, I think that is what Christianity mm -hmm. is, that relationship with God. So I, was, I just want to know, if, like, just because I brought it up, like, is that fair to, to or is that, is that accurate, you know, to uh, go on with that understanding that, that um, everyone, regardless, is going to... Oh, yes. Yeah. Is, is that's, uh, that's Philippians 2, 9 through 11. That's, oh. where, that's where the song comes from. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's that's uh, every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's Philippians two nine to eleven, mm. the great uh, the great Christ hymn. Um, yes, uh, because the idea there is that everyone, uh, friend and foe, it, you are either again you're either with the Lord or you're a vanquished foe. So that's the imagery because the imagery actually comes from the Old Testament, mm -hmm. and it refers to God prevailing. And it says, and every knee will bow, every tongue confess that I am Lord. Only here's the, the radical aspect of that now God apply, God himself applies it to Jesus and says they're going to kneel down before you. And they're going to have to acknowledge that you are Lord. And that's all right. Yeah, but of course, not everyone does it willingly. Mm. You know, and again, what they, of course they're going to believe in Christ. That, but at that point, if they don't believe yeah. in Christ, they just, that's just a pure. I accept Christ. You're, you're beyond, but they're not going to be saying, they're not going to believe in him in a sense of faith. Yeah, 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 yeah. Have accepted him. But they're going to, of course, realize, yes, he was the one. He really, he really was who he claimed to be. And, like know, in the same way demons proclaim it, right? Yeah. That's right. In James, uh, you, even demons believe and, and they tremble. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, a, it's not a personal faith. Yeah, but they don't change their ways. Yeah. Well, can they? Jesus didn't die for them. 
Is there really redemption for angels? I don't think so. Is there really redemption for angels? Yeah, you love why you just throw those things out. Like well, I don't think so. I think because I, I, I interpret that as uh, the unforgivable sin, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's, only, right. that's why I see it. Not that they it, did it with like, their eyes fully open. Yeah. But Jesus did not die for angels. Yeah, yeah, that's... He did not die as an angel. He died as a human for humans. Humans were deceived. You know, Lucifer and his hosts were not deceived. Yeah. They willingly, with eyes wide open, rebelled against God. Uh, humans, on the other hand, were deceived by the enemy to, to, uh, to rebel against God. They did a job on us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was... Uh, I have not, I always forget to do this, but I have not looked into that, the teaching that I've been given biblically about angels not having free will. Is that a thing anywhere in the Bible? Of course they have free will. Otherwise, how could they rebel? Exactly. No, that's why, again, that's why I understood. But again, I've been taught some things, uh, you know, in school and whatnot. Okay, I'm going to interject here, please. I, I love this. Tell me, what is your definition of what an angel is? Angelic being, uh, cherubim, okay. seraphim, they're actually angelic beings. Yeah. Can a human being be spiritually fit to be that of an angel type personality? No, because we're never meant to be angel type personalities. We're meant to be human type personalities. Okay, so we, we, you, I was not meant to be a dog type yeah. personality. You, read, <laughs> or, you originally said it, I'm a human about the re redemption of an angel. Yeah, they can never be redeemed. Fallen angels can never be redeemed. Fallen angels can never. For example, Lucifer. The demons are fallen angels. Okay. They're still angels, but they're fallen angels who have rebelled against God There's and are doomed because of that. But there's been no sacrifice for their redemption. Mm -hmm. Jesus died for right. human beings to be redeemed. Mm -hmm. He died as human. He became a man to die for humans. He did not become an angel and die for angels. And that's why I say that they have no redemption. Because someone will have to pay the penalty of their sin. Mm -hmm. And nobody has. I've been writing something for a long time. And there's... Um one angel in particular that I've read about, and it doesn't come from the Bible. The name of the angel is Artemis, A-R-T-E-M-I-S. And Artemis is a fallen angel that is the protector of children and animals and all kinds of things. And she supposedly... But this is a creation of yours? No, no. This is from Greek mythology. Yeah, oh, Greek mythology. I've heard, I've heard of... Yeah, yeah but oh. it's a story. Mm -hmm. it's just, oh, it's, it's like Greek like mythology. It's a whole big story oh. about yeah. angels. Oh, I just want to know where you're getting that from. <laughs> but it, it... Supposedly, Artemis takes on the shape of, of humans. I mean, I don't know what the true definition mm -hmm. of an angel is. Mm -hmm. But like Artemis is like an example. I mean, how do you know Luc Lucifer was a fallen angel? The devil himself, supposedly? Yeah. And he didn't have redemption. Yeah. He just stayed on the earth and that was it. And forever and ever and ever his spirit's going to walk the earth. Until he's condemned at the end. And turned and, and thrown into a lake of fire. That's the book of, that's book of Relation. It's really interesting. Yeah. But I'm obviously, where you are yet? <laughs> where, where the there are angels that watch over children. Uh huh. Christ speaks of that as well, uh, but not demonic angels, of course. Well, angels, Artemis good supposedly angels. wasn't demonic. Give me yeah. an example of uh, an angel that looks over children. Oh no! Just the, the Bible says that uh, he says about angels uh, that, that watch over kids. He says their angels intercede for them, watch over them. Really? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll find a passage, yeah. That would be great. Christ, Christ mentions it in passing. He talks about being like little children. He says that, that their are angels watch over them. Yeah. So that's where we get that idea about angels watching over kids. Mm -hmm. But obviously demonic angels would not be watching. <laughs> they wouldn't. But yes. <laughs> Maybe. They, they, they probably are. But not, yeah. not for the... <laughs> they're not watching over. Yeah. Watching over. I don't know. You see them fall. Yeah, exactly. Waiting for an opportunity. For something else. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did I... What? Did I answer your question? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, no. no. Okay. All right, let's finish up with that. Able to test and approve. The Christian is not meant to rely simply on a list of ethical commands 
Um, it's not like, you know, Jesus just gives you a list here, do's and don'ts. We're actually given the Holy Spirit so that we can test and approve, discern whether something is approvable to God or not approved to God. Of course, the Holy Spirit works in us and impresses on us the Word of God. But it's not like, you know, when Christians are like, oh, should I do this or not do this? Like, where's, where's that rule book I have, you know? No, it's like, it's, we're able to look at circumstances and discern uh, by, the, by the Spirit because we are giving ourselves completely to God whether something is of the Lord or not of the Lord. It becomes a natural, a natural part of us. But again, it's because we're, we're having that daily experience of giving our lives to God or you know, it becomes just part truly of our nature mm-hmm. to be able to discern the general ethical will of God without some sort of rule book in front of us. So that's something I was going to ask you at later, but it does apply. Because um, I look at that as when once receiving the Holy Spirit, Right, um, that we we adopt a sinless a sinless uh, life, and where we no longer again, I think we are made uh, righteous by the Spirit. And what that means, in order to be righteous, in order for our prayers to be effective uh, and and whatnot, they would have to be righteous, and they would have to be holy, right? And then the so Holy Spirit who does make us that, mm-hmm. you know, and so that I don't believe that we are sinners any longer once receiving the Holy Spirit. I think that it's like, it's, I, I truly believe it. We're dead to that. And being born again is being literally born into a sinless life because we are in Christ and we are the body of Christ. And Christ was without sin and we are His body. Then there's no possible way we could have sin. And I, I, I understand that in a, in a logical sense by looking at uh, something I read in Screw Tape Letters about how God... How God is able to forgive us is, is simply is because, uh, you know, He sees everything in the present. It's not that any, our forgiveness is contingent on what choice we're going to make and when that time comes. It's God sees us already doing it. When we get to that point, it's like, oh, I have to pray for this. I, I pray and repent because this is, I mean, He sees me doing it. Now I see myself doing it as well. But in regard, uh, regardless to God, everything is present. Because he's mm-hmm. eternal, so he can't see. He can't be. If if he wasn't, then Jesus' sin could not have been paid for us two thousand years later, or else that, that would not make sense. You know, God had to be able to. See, he has to see us doing the sin, you know, in order to forgive us of it. He's not mm-hmm. saying, "Well, I know you're going to do this, but you might make well, the choice." I would, I would not. say he has to do more than see us do it. He has to let us do it. Well, no, that as well. I, I, I agree with that. Because nobody ever, literally ever, I mean, for example, if God has said from the beginning, well, I know all of you are going to sin, and I'm going to redeem you to Christ, so we don't have to do any of this stuff. <laughs> we can start in heaven. Well, yeah. then I really haven't done anything bad. No, and I understand that. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to say in the sense that <laughs> there's no contingency, you know, for, uh, like, for, for the forgiveness of sin. Aside for, like, it's not based on when you're going to do it because God sees you doing it. Whatever choice you are going to make, He knows what that choice is going to be. Because what is it based on? He sees it. I think it's based on the fact of you're you doing it pre- in the present sense is what I'm trying to say. Not, and I say it's no, not contingent said, on the future you sense. You said forgiveness is not contingent on... I meant it on the future. The oh. future act of doing the sin. Because people, I think like... Because I don't, I don't agree with uh, anyone believing it's like, okay, I'm, you know... I'm not sinning today, but tomorrow, I don't know if I'm going to sin or not. Yeah, you don't know. But in the understanding as a Christian, you're forgiven for all sin. Mm-hmm. So I just like, now you know, it's like you sin, stop being Christian for a second, pray, ask for forgiveness, become a Christian again. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Like, no. you know what I'm saying? Well, I want to make so, a distinction between being a Christian mm-hmm. and sinning. Um, I don't think that every time a person sins, they somehow uh, stop being a Christian. Yeah, yeah. Um, because obviously, you know, for example, in First John it says um, that everybody sins. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, all we have to do is repent. I, yeah, I'm trying to stand the thought of what he's saying because I'm trying to think that even if I, and I would like to know where you, where you got the idea from, Lewis, or what gave you that that that, uh, that thought. Mm-hmm. Um, because I would say that even if you sin in the present, mm-hmm. you still need to repent in the present. Yes. No, okay. I, I know you need to repent. I'm trying to say is that. Um, the idea of being a Christian and being a sinner, I don't think it's, it's not possible to be the two. Mm-hmm. I think when you adopt uh, uh, the Christian 
life that you become and you are in Christ, you no longer are a sinner. Okay, I, I And I'm trying okay. to say that. So yeah, that right. sin that you okay. commit tomorrow, God already saw you do it mm -hmm. or sees you doing it yeah. in the first place before tomorrow even comes. He mm -hmm. sees you still doing it. And so when you repent, you know, because the Spirit will convict you yeah, to, yeah, yeah. to do so, when you do that, that's why it says, you know, it's already paid for. It's like the, and the fact that you accepted you were a sinner, acknowledge that all your sin is forgiven. And so that the okay. receiving of the I, Holy Spirit. I, I see what you're saying, yeah. That's I agree, I, I agree. You cannot really be a sinner and be a Christian mm -hmm. in the technical sense of those two words because yeah. a sinner is someone who actively lives in rebellion against God mm -hmm. uh, and a Christian is one who actively uh, engages in living for God. So yes, you're right. Um, it, it gets a little complicated once we start talking about the actual sins and repentance, but mm -hmm. I see that even there you're saying that if we do commit a sin, we still repent, but God sees it and God knows it and God has already uh, applied the atonement uh, yeah. to that. Oh yeah, no problem with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, I think it's very weird when a person, that, that's why First John makes it very clear about that, because John deals extensively with that in, in his letter. Um, that people who persistently live in sin are fooling themselves to think mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that somehow they have redemption because they, they, their very characteristic, their very lifestyle shows that there is no change. Yeah. They're, they're the same person. Yeah, so uh, yeah, of course, definitely. Any other questions? So we'll stop there because the next section is big. And we will be, like I said, once we get to the gift of prophecy, I want to deal extensively with that one. Something I love that I, I think is an amazing gift, but also because it says it.